Namaste India. I am Marika and all are Caribbean. I am Kanika Sharma and I am your host for this particular live. So before I begin with this session, with this uh, story, uh, you know, show, I would like to give a quick word of thanks to everyone who's joining us from different continents, India, US, UK, Australia, Caribbean, my friends, family, their relatives, friends and family. And of course, how can I ever proceed before thanking this amazing platform called A Story Club, run by these two awesome people, Arun Bhagwati and Shivani Dalat, and in fact, the entire team uh, of A Story Club. So who's been, you know, this entire week has been so special for me by, you know, both being creative, branding, et cetera. You know, I'm so thankful that you guys are giving, uh, you know, platforms to upcoming authors and, uh, already established author uh, alike. And thank you for introducing me to this wonderful global audience today. And I hope uh, the audience will enjoy this session as much as I am you know, enjoying hosting it. And yeah, so before we begin with the story telling session, it is, I think it is important to you know a few details about the host uh, herself, which is me. And um, about me, I'll be sharing a few details in the same format or fashion which this particular show has, which is storytelling. So if you talk about storytelling, and if we, if I, I, I like to introduce myself as somebody who is author, you know, who's HR by the day and author by the night. Why I'm saying so about myself, I will let you know as we proceed with the storytelling session. But uh, yeah, so first of all, um, you know, Something about me and uh, something about this uh, session that I'm taking, we'll be talking a lot about what interesting stories goes into the making of me as an author in general, what interesting stories goes into making it. Two of the books that I've published, the first one being Bikram and Bikram, this one I read last year in September, in fact, a few days uh, back, uh, it was its first anniversary. So, yeah, we'll be talking about more about that. We'll be talking about my second book that I've recently come up with, which is Memoirs, called Memoirs, The Imperfections of My Life. And yeah, so a lot of stories, and I hope you guys will stay throughout the session and enjoy these stories. Uh, I'm taking this live, as a matter of fact, from uh, New Delhi, India, uh, the capital of India. And the weather is lovely here. It's 9.30 uh, p.m. for me, Indian Standard Time. And uh, I know that you guys are joining us through a lot of different time zones. Thank you for that. And uh, yeah, so let's begin. So when I say uh, something about uh, myself, my journey of life has been very perfect, very unconventional or not mainstream, which is also, by the way, my Instagram handle says, Kanika underscore not mainstream, and you guys are free to follow it. And yeah, why I say so? Because um, I did my graduation in chemistry, okay, and then I went on to do my MBA in global business from a very prestigious college, Freedom College in Delhi University. And then when finally after studying global business, I landed up with HR, you know, as HR my uh, job profile. As a learning and development expert in HR, I thought that finally my, you know, my not mainstream journey has culminated in this, but it was not so. Uh, it so happened that last year I took up writing, something that I always wanted to do, but could never had the courage or time to follow. So, yeah, that's how my imperfect, unconventional and not mainstream journey continued. And uh, something that I took up as, as a part-time again, you know, I would go into the story of it and how it happened. So basically what happened is um, last year, it was, you know, when, when the pandemic hit, all of us on some levels were affected. Obviously some on, on more deeper level and a wider level, and, uh, you know, but each one of us did, did feel the impact of it. And with me, I was living in Mumbai back then, and which is the financial capital of India. I was working um, living in a rented apartment, pandemic hit, I had to quit my job. I had to vacate that, uh, you know, rent, rented apartment and come back to my city to cut some costs and, you know, my home city, Delhi. And this 
because of the economy, uh, you know, so down and everything, I could not, uh, but, you know, I could not get the job so easily, the next job. And um, I was, I was having these gray thoughts, I was having, you know, anxiousness, I was, I had, I was never someone, I was continuously working since the completion of my MBA, never someone who would sit at home. And all these things were making me a little anxious, you know, as to what turn my life could take. To keep all these negativity and great thoughts aside, I thought, you know, might as well uh, do something that I always wanted to do. And that was writing. So, you know, interesting thing here about uh, this pandemic is that we all, all like to, you know, see it as something which is unwanted. Of course, it is unwanted and why it is there, but... Uh, you know, it has obviously taken a lot from uh, many of you know many of us, um, our, our loved ones, our freedom to roam around freely without mask and everything, to 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 eat whatsoever we want to, you know, or, or the roadside junk food, especially in India. But it has we, we have to restrict on this. We have to you know follow certain protocols. But it has also also you know given us some some things that I like to see as um, optimist point of view or optimist, you know, silver lining of the pandemic. First thing is it has given us a lot of time. So, you know, earlier before 2020 or maybe 2019, we were all in a rat race to compete with one another in a rat race that was actually going nowhere, focusing on um, work, business, uh, money, and everything. And not on so much on the important other important issues. And when we were locked down in the house, I knew so many of the people who picked up new hobbies, who picked up singing, dancing, writing, many of them, uh, you know, picked up cooking. So it was rather lovely uh, to see that people who always wanted to do something but but were on short on you know time or had the paucity of time were actually taking out. You know, time for the things that they love. Uh, another thing that I would like to say that it has given us courage. It has given us a different perspective. Because when we see life being so fragile and so uncertain, you know, it can turn around in a flick of a second and everything. So we feel that there are, of course, other important issues than, than being, you know, just workaholic and just being it all about money or something. There is other important Facets of life, like our family, like you know, things that make us happy, like things we always wanted to do, our passion and everything. And that's what you know it did to me, changed my perspective completely. So why not started with writing as somebody, you know, who would like to keep anxiousness at bay and you know be involved in something productive, but it slowly uh, you know became the, you know, everything that I would eventually want to do all my life. And yeah, so telling you the story from the start. So let's, let's go back in time and visit uh, April 20th last year when I was, uh, you know, I, I didn't have any job. I, there was a sudden change then I had to shift from Mumbai to Delhi, you know, give up on my independence and living solo and everything. I came back here. Uh, I, I thought, you know, what to do, but if, even if I want to write, where should I start from? So what I did is I uh, started writing LinkedIn articles on the current hot going topic of then, which was COVID-19. And I've written a couple of articles and got praise from, you know, uh, various people, leaders on LinkedIn, and really boosted my confidence. So I thought, you know, why not? also try my hand at fiction since I loved reading fiction and you know read so much of fiction every day so I thought let's try my hand at that too but I didn't have the courage uh, back then so what I did is I started writing an online for various platforms um, posts etc et online reading platforms and eventually you know those started getting a lot of love and praise from and it again boosted my confidence. I thought, okay, now that I can write, I think I can write, let me contribute, uh, you know, a poem or something or a piece of prose, a two-pager or a, you know, 500, 700 words piece 
to, to something called anthologies, which is where a lot of writers, they contribute their pieces and it is edited and compiled by, you know, a senior writer or a, or a known writer or something. So that's what I did with, uh, you know, I, and eventually be a part of uh, five uh, best-selling anthologies. And later, you know, it all started in 2020. By September 2020, I think I was really confident enough to, you know, um, have having, uh, you know, confident enough to la now launch my own solo novel, which eventually I did. It um, was Vikram and Vikram that I showed you earlier. One, um, a horror genre novella. And it was, again, a very not mainstream kind of a genre for somebody who's an upcoming writer to, and that to a female writer. Because, of course, when we, you know, still date, only probably the most um, loved and known horror genre writer of Stephen King. And there's hardly anyone who stands next to him. So, you know, I, I did feel marginalized, but then I, this is something that I wanted to, I, I was a big consumer of horror genre. So I thought that I'd write about this. And the, the topic was very nice. Was an Indian folklore, a twisted folklore, and you know something that points out to certain mal practices in our society. So I launched that, and I, it, I never sort of expected it, uh, you know, to get a response from audience. It was more like a personal project to me, like something that I want to, you know, check off my bucket list for quite a long time. But then uh, when it started getting loud, then then that's when I took writing seriously and that's when I thought that I wanted to do to pursue this thing for maybe the rest of my life along with the job or you know eventually if I think turns good for me maybe you know just writing so yeah and uh, it so happened that I, I finally got a job and everything and uh, what started as something to keep me just you know a pastime kind of a thing to keep me away from negativity it eventually, I, I, you know, I used to find out time apart from my job to write something, to work on my second novel. And I never, this was the journey I hopped on and never got off. Essentially, it is still continuing for me. It's still wonderful. And, uh, you know, I, I got featured on so many platforms, got featured on All India Radio uh, twice. I got featured on uh, various national and international projects in magazines like Inspire, Delhi Poetry Slam, and been a book Instagrammer with uh, and book critic with a couple of uh, you know renowned platform like Delhi Poetry Slam and uh, Half Baked Beans, etc. So yeah, and now I'm back with my second book. Recently, I launched uh, this year, 2021, I launched a uh, memoir. It's called Memoirs: The Imperfection of My Life, and it is going to be the central theme. For us tonight, we'll be talking about more stories that led to memoirs. Why, you know, why the name, why the tagline, and all those stories. So yeah, let's begin with memoirs. So it says, "Memoirs: The Imperfections of My Life." If I read out the blurb to you, it says that this book celebrates the imperfections of my life, and as suggested, these are expressed as my musings a collection of my musings in various forms, poems, closes, essays that will remind you of a similar emotion and strike a familiar chord. So yeah, you know, uh, a couple of things that I want to share about the poem what makes it really special and uh, really different that I feel I'm really proud of. Uh, first thing is that uh, the Moyers is Breaking the conventions in various uh, in various means, you know, uh, it is bilingual. It has items or pieces in English, it has pieces in Hindi, which is the native language of India. And secondly, uh, it ha it has all genres of writing, you know, it has poems, prose, essays. It in fact has fiction and non-fiction essays in the same book. So it has something for everyone. You know, one of my friend or you know, the viewer, she stated very beautifully that it is like an Indian thali, an Indian buffet platter that essentially offers something to everyone of their own taste. So yeah, I think that that really summarizes what memoirs is in terms of writing style. 
Now, why the name memoirs? Why I chose this? A lot of people say that, you know, memoirs are supposed to be written by somebody famous, somebody who already has an eventful life, like, you know, a Priyanka Chopra Jonas or Sachin Tendulkar or something. So why, you know, you being somebody who's essentially not a celebrity, an ordinary person, so why would you write or name your book as memoirs? Well, because I believe that, you know, uh, essentially all of us, um, have something to share or have some incident in our lives that is eventful and that's need to, that you know, needed to be shared with everyone that could strike a chord of similarity and nostalgia among all of us who, who read it. So hence the name Memoirs and uh, essentially, you know, we feel that poetry is something that has to be complicated and everything, but I do feel that it has to be something which can make the reader feel that, oh, I think in something similar. So uh, hence this is a collection of my music. And now people say that, okay, why why do you say that it celebrates imperfection? You know, nobody wants to talk about imperfection. We all want to talk about perfect work, perfect life, and perfect everything else, perfectionism. But I feel that you know perfectionism is a myth. Having said that, there are so many, you know, poetry and prose in Indian uh, English literature in general contemporary and classic alike, you know, that talks about nature, romanticism, that celebrates perfectionism and the beauty of perfectionism and uh, everything. So if you talk about, you know, one of the famous uh, poets, John Keats, he says the thing of beauty is a joy for him. And essentially there's so many of uh, poems solely dedicated to nature's beauty or to romantic beauty and everything. But I feel that those, those are just, you know, perfection, like I said, is a myth. Uh, imperfection or flaws are rather evil and rather beautiful, I feel, that needs to be celebrated and talked about. So you can say it's it's kind of a style, writing style that I also discovered myself, uh, you know, about myself on this journey. That I like to talk about something which is ordinary, which is mundane, which is everyday, you know, beauty in, in the mundane is what essentially I figure out eventually, couple over couple, you know, book over book, and, you know, submissions over submissions that I discovered that my genre, slice of life, something of everyday things and beauty, seeing beauty in that. So hence also, I, I think I need this as memoirs, the imperfection of my life, celebrating something which is very ordinary and yet very real. So, yeah. And now, without with all the stories about what goes into uh, making, you know, my book, and what goes into uh, making uh, me as an author. Now, let's talk about each of the you know segments that this book has. Um, like I already told you that it has four segments essentially: poems, prose, fiction essays, and non-fiction essays. So what I'll do is I'll be taking you three to you know all you uh, all of you guys through these um, segments and um, I'll be giving you a brief premise of what all it entails each of the segment what all it entails and then probably be reading out two of my favorite or two of my personal gems that I feel of that particular segment and I'll not be reading the entire segment entire of uh, piece maybe just to give you an insight as to what goes into it and so that you can, you know, you get tempted to read it eventually. So yeah, without much ado now, let's begin with the first section of this particular book, which is the poem section. So it has nine poems in all. Uh, most of it are in English. One particular poem is in Hindi. So now I, I'll give you one by one, the brief reminds of each of these uh, nine poems. And the first one is, um, I dream, I have a dream. So I have a dream is basically uh, written from the point of view of young girls around the world. This poem narrates small but meaningful aspirations of young girls when it comes to love and relationship. It was published as a part of uh, Around the World Anthology by Notion Press. So like I said, uh, you know, uh, an important uh, point that I uh, want to 
make. I, I actually forgot uh, to tell about it earlier. That all these poems, they, they are essentially also the entries. You know, uh, remember the time that I was talking about that I used to send uh, entries and prompts to various national, international, uh, you know, submission competitions or prompts given for a specific occasion, like, like a Valentine Day prompt or like a Halloween prompt. So all these, you know, um, poems have a unique and a different flavor because each of them was sent to these different anthologies and prompts and magazines for various occasions. So hence they're very, very vivid and different in their, um, in their approach, in their uh, unique in their flavor. Uh, unique in their different in their genre, but something there's something which connects them all. They're all bound by you know the string of nostalgia, an ounce of hope, and a bit of melancholy in all of them. So I like to call call this particular collection of my poems as a string of hope and a venture of despair. So yeah, yeah. Well, you must have guessed that I am also a Charles Dickens fan, by the way. So yeah, with that, now let uh, let me you know just revisit uh, the first poem that I talked about. I have a dream written from a point of view of young girls around the world. This particular poem talks about little aspiration, but meaningful aspiration of all the girls in general when it comes to love and relationship. This particular book was part of Around the World Anthology by Nushin Pen. Before I move on to the demise of second poem, I would like to say if you, you know, now that I'm talking about each of the contents that goes into that book, if you have any, you know, particular question or any any heartfelt comment that you want to take, I may not be uh, able to answer it right now, but please do put it in the comment section. Please do mention of it. I will definitely take up after the show. So, yeah. Now, moving on to the next poem of the book. The second poem is called The Tale of Two Cities. Yeah, well, like I mentioned, I love Charles Dickens. And uh, this is an essay stylized abstract poem written from a point of view of somebody who is an Indian uh, who has left his hometown of Delhi, of the city of Delhi, and moved to New York uh, as a student for uh, you know, education purposes. And a very beautiful coincidence associated with this is uh, when I wrote this, it was a fictional. Uh, fictional poem that how that particular student would suddenly come across cultural differences, would, what kind of cultural differences would he feel at first and how they would eventually change over a period by the time he or she finishes her, his or her education. Now, beautiful coincidence that happened to be is my own cousin, uh, she got off to New York recently and she got admitted in uh, NYU. And the kind of uh, cultural differences she feels I, I so related to this particular poem and uh, hence you know I would like to dedicate this one to her. It was again uh, published as part of uh, Days and Nights Anthology uh, published by Notion Press. The third poem of this book is, is a very special poem. Uh, a couple of snippets is also mentioned you can see in the Facebook uh, you know this particular Facebook live uh, caption you can see a part of this poem. This poem is really appreciated like all the books the grammar so far who have uh, reviewed my book or the comments that I get on uh, you know, Goodreads or Amazon or you know Google reviews. I mean eight out of ten times it does mention of this book as one of their favorites. Who am I? Because this is you know so relatable. It says it's from a point of view of a young person who says that uh, you know, I don't know who am I. And when it comes to the thoughts around my own identity, I feel that I'm like a poem. Because like the latter, my moods, my my themes, my nature is different every day and is changing every day as per the situation. So it makes that person a living poetry in motion. And this was uh, featured on the National Poetry Challenge by Pindas Baby Brick. And it was again loved a lot. Okay. Now moving on to the fourth poem for today that we're going to uh, talk about. Fourth poem of this book, in fact, is called Defining Hope. Again, written from a point of view of somebody who's uprooted from his native place and plays into a foreign city or a foreign land or country, and how that person misses home and what essentially the definition of home for his, you know, for him or her is. So that's what defining home is all about. 
It was published as part of a selected poem anthology by Select Publishing House. And now coming on to the next poem that this uh, particular book has. In fact, poem number fifth and sixth is something very special to me. I will quickly, you know, uh, give you a premise of these two poems and then tell you why it was so special to me and why it marked my growth as an author. I personally feel that these two pieces marked my growth as an author. So the, the fifth poem is, Could I Be Completely Blamed? It was written as an LGBTQ uh, prompt. Confession style letters, the genre. And it's an abstract poem wherein two women, you know, who are somewhere both each other's culprit. But if we see in at large, they are nothing but the victims of society and the stringent times that are there. And the essence of the poem unfolds as one of the women. She, you know, she has a com confession to make, which is a very unbecoming kind of a truth. She's saying it at a very unlikely place in a very unseemingly manner. So that's what could I be completely blamed for you. I very close to my heart. I will come to it, uh, you know, in a second. Why? Uh, let me just uh, focus and give you a premise of poem number seven, which is one last mistake. Uh, it's in a freestyle erotica, somewhere between that of a poem and prose, and it narrates the tale of a woman's guilty pleasure. It was featured in a UK-based magazine, Ink Fire, and again, you know, uh, the editor was all praises about this. So uh, why I just love these two pieces that I just mentioned is uh, they mark my growth as an author. You know, in Indian household, certain topics are very taboo. Okay, it is not very easy to talk about or to write about or to you know even uh, to an extent uh, for an individual to think about these topics of you know sexuality or intimacy. And when I was writing, um. Uh, you know these two, two poems for the for the prompt which was of erotica genre or lgbtq genre i was really nervous i thought of dropping off my name from from that so the thought maybe you know if if my people or my folks back home would read it what would they think about me what would they think of me and would it be appreciated at large but i was so happy when it turned out and it got praised by the best of the people who were already pro in writing in that particular genre. So that was a big beat for me as a, as a, as a writer, I felt, as a poet. And yeah, now um, the, like the seventh poem in the book is called Yad Satayagi, which is a Hindi poem. And it essentially means that you will remember me. It's nothing but a broken heart's ballet to mend itself after a breakup or a tough relationship. So now let's come down to the last two poems, poem eight and nine, that I'll be taking tonight and I'll be reading a part of it. So the, the, the one that I'll be talking about firstly is called Dreams, Dreams the Treacherous Dream. Now dreams and treacherous are two antonyms kind of a word in itself. Because when we talk of dreams, it's, it's a positive, blessful word. And we all need, know the meaning of treacherous and means betrayal. It, it is not a positive word. It's a negative, has a negative connotation to it. Now, why I say dreams to treacherous being? Because it is the take which is from the point of view of a pessimist. So it's a very dark and annoyer kind of a take on dreams. What happens when somebody is not able to fulfill his or her dreams, when he or she is frustrated, when the dreams become too much, it's kind of a burden to, to carry around. And especially for somebody who's, you know, who's going through something and disturbed or depressed, these dreams are no longer some golden aspiration, but something uh, which is too heavy, excruciating to, to, you know, to carry. This, this piece is very close to my heart because it was my first ever published uh, piece on a on a, a huge platform like Delhi Poetry Slam, something you know that of a state or a national level. So yeah, I'll be reading that. Uh, last uh, but not the least, next poem that I've i okay. Let me just actually first take you through these, and then I talk about the second poem that I'm going to be taking after that. So it says dreams, you treacherous beast. 
dreams are treacherous beings. They are no railing to hope, as you thought, but a slippery slope of delusions. Nightmares are not the real will of the world. No, nightmares wake you up from the slumber at least. It is the dream. Dreams are the treacherous beings. They make you go through sleepless nights. They make you chase them as if they are some golden larks, failing at which you will be pushed only into deeper into the dark. They will make you believe in fairy tales that aren't real. You falsely believe they are made up of colors so bright, gold and silver. And but I did not dream of fairy tales. Mine was just as regular. All I ever wanted was to be happy, hearty, and gay. All I ever longed for me, going away from me, sands of time slipping through my fingers. All the happiness standing there, mocking me in the face while I long for it. Oh, dreams, pray tell, what do I do with the perpetual sadness that you've given, that forever lingers? I long for happiness every day, and every day my breath becomes more labored. Tired and done now with this forever chasing, I curse myself. I curse myself for chasing you, because you dream are treacherous, treacherous, and wild. So yeah, well, that was kind of dark and I still get goosebumps till day uh, when I read this and yeah. So uh, the last poem that is part of this book and that I'm going to be uh, taking with is, is a deliberate attempt to shift to something which is more light, which is more happy, uh, which is more, you know, which brings a smile to everyone's face. Also very, very, you know, special for me because it is about Harry Potter. Harry Potter is something that we've all read, maybe, or not even read, so that we, we must have seen at least one movie or the other uh, of the Harry Potter series. And essentially, it is loved across age groups, you know, by, by elderly, by children. It is why it is special for me. Why I wouldn't say that I, uh, you know, uh, what took me to write uh, reading was uh, Harry Potter. No, I've been reading for from the age of 10 or 11 because I was essentially uh, an introvert child who preferred reading more than talking to people or that playing out on street. So yeah, I was reading from that time, but when I, when I talk about coming to the other side of the coin, which is writing, Harry Potter is essentially something that brought me to that time. You know, when I, I, I read this masterpiece, I was completely in awe of this person called Miss J.K. Rowling and the kind of writer that she is, you know, uh, so much of depth to each character, so much of layering in the storyline. And, you know, it is not really easy. I, I, while I was reading more than the story, what intrigued me that it is not easy to write six volumes of, of a book. And, you know, ultimately in the end, there's no glitches. All the pieces just fix into places like a, like a perfect jigsaw puzzle. And I wanted to become that kind of a writer. I, I wanted to be, you know, match up to that kind of a writing. I'm still trying, I think it's, it's a long way to go, but you know, um, I think that made Harry Potter very, very special for me. It, it gave me the motivation to write. And uh, in fact, in my first book, my first solo novel, Vikram and Bittu, the entire acknowledgement page is dedicated solely to Miss Rowling. And um, even in the second book, I managed to pull out a, a fan tribute or a fan letter to Mr. J.K. Rowling. And that's what the title of this poem is. It says, my letter to Hogwarts, a fan's tribute to Mr. J.K. Rowling's master. So yeah, let's see this together. And maybe, uh, you know, those of, the, those of you who are a Potterhead uh, can uh, tell me about your experience and your connectivity with this particular um, poem. Uh, in the comment section, that's how you felt about it. Yeah, let's read this one. Very short poem. Dear Miss Rowling, this is my tribute to you as a Potterhead, a token of thanks for making me inclined towards writing. My gratitude for keeping the child in me alive, for making me believe in magic. You taught me that those who don't believe in magic will never find it. But I have an age to grind. I'm still awaiting for that forward letters rightfully mine. I wanted to meet you in person and to the boy who lived, 
the boy who was just like his father but had his mother's eye in my weak time i wanted to hear from the headmaster so wise oh my child you will find the time light in the darkest of the time only if you remember to turn on the light and when memories of lo uh, lost love and heartbreak became too much i wanted to remove those threads from my mind into the pencil why miss rowling why is me asking for a homework letter so expensive i wanted to meet my favorite professor and confess that i always believed in him after all this while and will always miss rowling i hope you tell me that that it's just about the time hogwarts sent me the letter that i so deserve sincerely a potter so this is a sweet letter that i uh, you know actually wrote to miss jk rowling and uh, yeah well i'm still awaiting uh, my hogwarts letter till date so do let me know if you guys are too with that said um let's move on to the next section of the book which is prose section again uh, like the poetry section it is vivid and vibrant with a lot of unique uh, you know flavors different kind of genres different writing style also that i have um, you know put up in this one so uh, the first one is is a collection of uh, micro fiction prose like less than 100 words a four liner terribly tiny fiction kind of thing so these are also featured at various forums on on websites like the ink man page uh, tdd etc and it is essentially uh, you know in, in two languages hindi and english uh, i'm not be reading or taking up these tonight because these are just four liners we move on to the next part of fiction which are the flash fiction a uh, you know shorter than short story kind of a thing maybe between 500 or 700 words uh there are around um, three short flash fictions and a short story with around seven more than 700 uh to up to 1000 words so let's talk about the first flash fiction that we have we are not going to be reading this one tonight but just to give you a premise kind of a thing the first flash flash fiction is actually called breaking news and the premise says a mundane news room a formidable news reporter and a lackluster routine all changes for good in the newsroom unexpectedly when a secret comes out in the open so what is that secret you have to find out yourself it was a part of a top 15 micro fiction anthology competition run by a particular publication house the second book that we will be going to that okay so the second book uh, that is there is this is a short story let's talk about short story first and it's again very close to my heart um, an, uh, a different kind of a genre fantasy romance so it's an unusual love story and uh, just to you know just a question for a premise how far would you go to keep a promise that you made to somebody you you love would you even return from the dead from come back from the dead to you know fulfill that promise this is what this particular uh, chapter the promise explores uh, now i you know don't want to give out on the plot much so let's move on to the two uh, you know uh, chapters that will be reading tonight again not the entire chapter but a brief of it just to give you an insight of what as to what goes into that particular chapter maybe to give you a brush with my writing so the first one is called uh, the gifting ritual again a short flash fiction of around 700 words it is the genre is uh, heartbreak uh, betrayal and it's a tale of ritual revenge and regret what will happen if you find out you know that your partner has been cheating on you so now a food for thought uh, for my audience that infidelity is something which is you know becoming a lot more common these days and we all know somebody or somebody who somebody who you know uh, who is indulging in this and we at times don't know what stand to take for it what you know whether to move whether to part ways with our partner or whether to you know accept the apology and move on or whether to just accept the situation and you know be hopelessly accepting about it so 
this is the question that this chapter also explore and um, i'm sure uh, i would uh, like to ask my readers to also know their own this one but talking about the gifting ritual it is story of sia it is the story of pratha their love is something that has been all of it you know they were right from the they broke days when they were two bloke couple from you know college sweethearts or something so now that they've become these established individuals with every you know everything that they want in their lives money luxury power but their love is not essentially the same so yeah uh, with that said uh, let me just give you a quick uh, you know read into what goes into the gifting ritual and then i will come back to the last uh, story of the prose section that we'll be talking about today so yeah At 4:40 a.m., Sia lay awake in her bed, deep in her thoughts. A screeching car tires breaks the silence of early dawn. She peeps from the window. It is Raghav, her husband, getting out of the taxi. Like a wife who is now used to her husband's sudden business trips, she does not bother to get up. Raghav deftly pays the taxi driver with one hand and keeps the luggage inside his sprawling mansion with another. Entering the lavish living room, he tilts his head to peep into the bedroom where his pretty wife was sleeping. A feeling of guilt surges in him. I'm so sorry, Sia. I know I haven't been faithful to you, but that's going to change now. He promises softly to himself. Determined, he takes out a small but beautifully wrapped package from his bag and keeps it on the expensive mahogany center table. Delhi winters. It's so cold. I must take a quick shower. He says to himself again, realizing that it was chilly in the living area. As the noise of scalding water hits the floor, he awakens from her partial slumber. Might as well sir make coffee now that I'm fully awake. She mumbles to herself and moves towards the kitchen. On her way to kitchen, she sees a beautifully wrapped package on the center table. She didn't have to open it to guess its content, but yet she mechanically opens the entire package. Ferrara rushes. Oh, Raghav, you never fail to disappoint me. She says to herself with a tinge of sarcasm. In her mind, she goes back to the time when she used to love Ferrara's. Her eyes used to glint up whenever Raghav used to bring those for her. That was the time she thought. You were in that rich. But you used to save little money to buy me even a small pack of Ferrero's, saved only for special occasions. But now that you have everything, your Ferrero surprises have become more frequent. But it no longer lifts up my eyes. She was saying this to all to herself, and Raghav's baritone interrupted her thought. Like this, my love, your favorite, isn't it? It's a limited edition. Their eyes meet. And the melancholy in her eyes. A wordless communication transpired between them, like it used to, in you know, ages away, and then that they haven't done in a while. In a moment, Raghav realizes. She knows. She knows. He whispers to himself. It didn't take him long to deduce that his wife by now knew his chronology. Every time that Raghav would cheat on her, he would bring her her favorite Ferraros as an absolution to his guilt, and hence she now hated Ferraros. I will give you some clothes, Sia says, diverting her moist eyes eyes from her husband. When did I become that abhorrent creature? Raghav asked himself when Sia left. This entire trip. He has been futilely pondering over the same question. Maybe it was money. Maybe it was power. But he wanted to change now. He wanted to be true to Sia. He glances the untouched chocolates, and ironically, for the first time in years, he had bought these chocolates not out of guilt, but as a medium to confess everything. But it wasn't necessary now that she knew. So, guys, what do you think will happen? What do you think? Will Ria forgive Raghav, or will Raghav change or mend his ways, or will Raghav get the taste of his own chocolate? 
you'll have to find out in this particular story a gifting ritual from my book memoirs now moving on uh, to the next story that we have the vetal it's a common indian folklore with a twist that holds the mirror to corrupt practices that goes into the society till day you know as a indian child uh, most of us have heard about vetal or have seen the stories or read the book uh, but this one is kind of a modern take on vetal so what is it let's see the genre is more horror um, you know 500 to 700 words again and let's read so on a chilly night of panchkani a man smoked chillam in his veranda it was all dark but a small light from a nearby bonfire kept him from freezing and was making his face glow Oh, what is better than raising stars while smoking chillum? He murmured lazily. The bright moon in the clear sky was suddenly engulfed by a black shadow, which went unnoticed by this man so lost in his thoughts. His reverie was, however, broken when the negligible light coming to his face from the bonfire was also blocked by the same black shadow. The man turned around and saw an unearthly creature looming in the air. What was this creature? He thought. It looked nothing like anything he had seen so far. It was a dark, smoky, shapeless creature, shapeless mass with deformed holes for features. He felt that the creature was, in fact, the inhabitant of some god-forsaken, deepest circles of hell, cursed to roam the eternity of earth. The man was experiencing the most horrifying incident of his life. He wanted to scream, but his mouth froze in a perpetual O. He wanted to run for his life, but his feet were not his anymore. He wanted to, you know, divert his eyes, but his eyes were widened, never leaving that ghastly creature that was now moving towards him. The man froze in the spot, sweating profusely in the eight degree cold, and while the creature bared his what seems like fangs in a mirthless laugh. almost levitating it moved towards the man seeing his impending doom the man prayed to whatever gods he could remember for a cardiac arrest or any quicker death than the one that approached him for him his fate was already sealed by the entity or as the local had christened it the vetal vetal loomed over him it scooped him up in the air with its foam like hands and ripped his chest apart his flesh spurted around man convulsed vomited a cocktail of blood and entrails he screeched in pain a pain so chilling that it could have frozen bones apart the scream was then accompanied by another thud a thud of utensils scattering on the ground in a single flip vetal turned around and saw a lady frozen with shock and yet shivering in fear simultaneously fascinating the vital spoke in broken syllables and then bared its fangs another mirthless laughter in the new and this new victim the lady's eyes widened with, with fear she now saw her dead husband falling on to the ground and the vital was now slowly approaching her so i would uh, keep you guys up her and to know who is this vetar and why is he actually after this family and what will happen will this lady survive or will she again be the victim of vetar you'll have to find out and read this particular chapter the vetar from a uh, memoirs now because we are approaching towards i guess uh, you know towards the timeline that we had so i will quickly introduce you to the next uh, two section of the book the the first section is called uh, the essay section which has fiction and non fiction essays so first we'll talk about fiction or personal essays it has two essays essentially uh the first one is called pagli which uh, is a hindi word and in english it means a mad woman it's a synonym for a mad woman so pagli is a memoir which is about an unlikely bond between two women who are poles apart who are from a very different strata of society and an unlikely friendship or a bond of acquaintance developed between them 
the major theme of this book uh, this particular essay is bonding friendship uh, you know nostalgia feminism mental health etc and then uh, another of my very favorite essay the second essay which is of this book is called a letter to my uh, daughter it is like the name just letter addressed to my future daughter like a guiding beacon of advice for not just surviving but thriving in this practical world you know so a lot of uh, uh, books the grammar and reviewers have also mentioned this one and uh, you know a lot of people that i know my friends and family have uh, dm'd and you know personal message me about this one that they they've had tears in their eyes and this is something that you know they actually want to take some snippets from it and tell them to their future daughter about this so you know what happens many a times when we feel that oh i wish that somebody would have told me when i was 16 about this or somebody would have told me when i was 20 that you know uh, you will you will sail through this that that's what i wanted would have wanted to hear so this is something which you can also say like a note to yourself and it was again a part of uh, this international project called a jar of letter which has you know various letters addressed to to your exes future self younger self future daughter this was one uh, one of the entries that was selected in that international project so what i'll do is i'll be reading out of these two the first one i mean the second one which is a letter to my future daughter and i'll be again reading just snippets from the beginning middle and the end not the entire letter if you like this letter if it touches your heart i would like you to read it from the book itself in its eternity um uh, now let's begin so it says dear future daughter i can't wait to hold your little self in my arms and teach you kindness patience and all those virtues that have become so rare in this world but till the time arrives i'm going to pour out my heart to you via this letter something you can refer to as a note to self or as a constant company when i am no longer with you just as a guiding beacon of practical advice for not just surviving but also thriving in this patriarchal world based on my own experience first things first i want you to know that you are loved you deserve to be loved and this is irrespective of your color height weight and any other bodily feature i want you to know that i'm proud of you for being a girl happy for you to choosing me as your mother and despite what they tell you it is okay to run like a girl to play like a girl and to fight like a girl because in fact you are one and always remember as a matter of fact that it is a pride to be born as one the creator of life itself now coming to other aspects promise me that my dear you will never kill your dreams to make a make a way for the dreams of others do remember that keeping your husband's last name isn't going to make you a good traditional wife nor does the addition of his name next to your retained maiden name will make you look any any modern because the true sense of identity does not lie in the last name it lies in you and your given name don't be a mr or miss last name be devoid of any traces of your martyred status or your caste or religion and now to conclude a line from the end in the end my only advice to you is to not follow my advice blindly but to make your own way choose this as a guiding beacon of life but you have to choose your own path so if you like this particular letter and want to read the entire letter you know what to do and we are really short on time so let's just quickly i'll quickly talk about the last section maybe uh, you know not take one of the essays from that uh, that i'll be leaving up to you just give i'll, I'll just give you the premise of it so these are non fiction letters that i have you know non fiction essays essentially so in the beginning i talked about you know the very first articles when i started writing on linkedin uh, you know about this ongoing pandemic and covid era so this is my covid 19 series which has essentially four uh, articles or essays the first one says covid 19 bringing out the humane side of business so this is an optimist take on pandemic and its impact on business and especially in the developing countries 
trying to find out the silver lining. This essay elaborates on bringing out the humane side of COVID uh, of businesses through COVID-19. The second article is cited, COVID-19, a time to come together more constructively than ever. Well, in my understanding, there has never been a time better than this for coming together and contemplating more constructively on self-growth, introspection, working on our strengths and weaknesses alike, and being prepared for a completely new corporate world that you know this pandemic will eventually going to usher in. The third article of the series is COVID-19 maintaining sanity during the lockdown. It is you know critical to understand that uh, COVID-19 is as much as of a mental game as it is physical, and that we all have to take precautions to stay safe physically. But what all we can do that it does not break us mentally. So it's a, you know, uh, it's a combination of tips and tricks that I have personally experienced and to, you know, to avoid feeling being overwhelmed and anxious and stressed during this very stressful uh, period. So, and the last one uh, or the fourth article of the series is called the COVID crisis and what has it taught us to the new age business. So some of the world's greatest economies including ours, the fastest growing economy in the world, have come to standstill. The fog wheels of industrialization shun to a bare minimum. And the favorite jargons and slogans of business world are now replaced by stay home and stay free. So this is for communist and capitalist countries alike. So this is the new age business that the pandemic is ushering in and what is here for us to learn from it. This art, last article is all about that. So if you find, you know, you have a interest or inclination towards nonfiction articles and you find the topic interesting and relevant, you are again feel free to, you know, read it from the book memoirs. And but now I will give rest to the storytelling session. It's I think already been one hour and I hardly, you know, um, took time of uh, took notice of the time. It was so, so nice to talk to each of you. It was so nice to be on this wonderful show by a Sobi Club. And um, last but not least, I will again conclude in thanks. Thank you for being, uh, you know, part of this show from, from various countries and time zones that you people are logging in. Thank you, a Sobi Club, for introducing me to this lovely audience. Thank you, you know, Arun um, Bhagwati and Shivani Dalal, Hitika, you know, members of um, a story club for organizing this wonderful event, uh, you know, uh, show. And uh, again, for making me feel so special in this entire week with all the creatives and everything. And I hope that you guys loved the session and enjoyed it as much as I did. And I hope that you liked something about my book, uh, at least something, I hope. And you would definitely like to check it out the link, etc. I would request uh, the team of a story club if they can place, you know, put up the link to, to the district, uh, I mean, to the, to the, they can put up the link to my book, purchase link to my book in the description. And yeah, that's it. I would now be signing off. Thank you so much for joining me.